All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. ish Eastern, which means it's time to start today's Entree Architect Context and Clarity conversation. It's Context and Clarity Live today. Welcome. Glad that you're here. Say hi when you get here. Uh, let us know that you're here and where here is for you. Where, are you. where in the world are you? Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis. I'm not in, I'm not even in Indianapolis today. I'm in Atlanta yeah. today. I'm usually in Indianapolis. Um, we come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled the date on the calendar and you said 2022 is my year and you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 28 years and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture. And they're all the need to know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So Thanks for joining us today. Welcome. Say hi when you get here. Um, it's great to have you here. Sorry about the background music. Part of the game today is to guess what song is playing in the background. I'm looking <laughs> um, forward to that game. Yeah, I know you are. I know you are. I love games. We're, we're, I love games, Jeff. Catherine loves games and rules, if you haven't figured that out yet. Which so, go together, by the way. Rules, Jake, the, that's what a game is, something you're doing with rules. There's a direct correlation there. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. As as usual for Context and Clarity Live, Catherine McPhail has joined me today. Hi, Catherine. Hello, hello. Hopefully things are a little calmer where you are than on this end of the phone line. I would say so. That's so good. far anyway. It's just another just another Thursday over here. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, we've got the we've got the two uh, soup cans with the string pulled pretty tight at this point. So uh, we'll see we'll see how this goes today. Uh, what could go see. wrong? We, nothing. Nothing. It's impossible. Mm. All right. Let me let me look. Who who is? Um, I think on my screen I see Kurt over there on Twitch joining us from Flint, Michigan. I think he's first on my screen, which means that he is the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. Congratulations, Kurt! Thanks for joining us. Thanks for holding up the uh, Twitch community over there. Glad that you're over there. Scott Thrift is in warm, hazy San Francisco. Welcome back, Scott. And he's over on LinkedIn. Benita, thanks for the wave from Atlanta. Glad you're joining us today. Jefferson from Los Angeles, linking in, as he says. He's on LinkedIn. Christo Velli has joined us from YouTube. He says, can't seem to find on Facebook yet. Sure, it's just lagging behind. Uh oh, hopefully it picks up on uh, on Facebook here momentarily. But thanks for the heads up. And uh, let's see, Benita says, welcome to the range. Yeah, um, that's one reason I'm sitting in a Starbucks right now is because a lot in traffic and torrential rain. Let's see. Chris says Catherine's the game master. She certainly is. Vanessa, welcome from upstate New York. Thanks for the wave from up there. Glad you're joining us today. Kurt celebrating. It has been a long time since uh, since Kurt won a uh, crochet bathtub award. If you happen to be on Facebook right now, maybe you're commenting, maybe you're typing away, putting things in the comment section that are not showing up on the screen. And you're going, what's going on? What's what's up here? What's wrong with this situation? Well, it's probably because you're in a, uh, a private Facebook group, which has privacy policies, obviously. Won't, Facebook won't allow your name and your likeness and so on to leave Facebook to, to uh, come over here to Restream, which is the platform that we use. However, we have a solution. Down at the bottom left of the screen right now is a URL. You can type this into your browser window, chatrestream.io slash FB. Sort of like Facebook chat.restream.io slash FB. And uh, once you do that, a couple of clicks later, you will give Facebook permission to talk to Restream and all, all of your problems, every single one of them will be solved. They'll be taken away just with a few clicks. So try that out. Um, and hopefully somebody is actually seeing this on Facebook. We had this problem last week, didn't we? We've Facebook had a lot of weird problems lately with Restream. What's, I mean, um, I think not we should blame, blame it on Zuckerberg. No, I'm, yeah. I'm blaming on Mark Zuckerberg. Sure. That's sure to get us yeah, banned. We... All right. <laughs> Maybe. Well, let's see. Leslie is joining us from uh, Transylvania, North Carolina. Welcome back, Tran Transylvania, Leslie, uh, over on YouTube. And Melanie has found us on YouTube as well. All right. So if, if we're not showing up on Facebook,
Facebook. Chris says it's still not showing up there. Um, if someone or all of you would do us a favor and just post, hey, jump over to um, the Entree Architect YouTube channel to, uh, to find context and clarity live, that would be a help. Let's get everybody over there since, um, since we seem to have a, a communication issue there. In the meantime, let's get this started. We have a guest, actually two guests today. They're waiting patiently in multi-green rooms. We're, we're bi-coastal, we're all over, we're, we're coming close to our goal of breaking the internet today. We have two guests in two different green rooms, green M&Ms in both, in both of the green rooms, so you don't need to worry about that. They're waiting back there patiently for us. So um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Let's get them kicked off here. Um, the, our guests today are both Cornell educated architects. They have both taught and or still teach design and architecture classes in different programs around the country. And maybe their maybe their stories diverge from it. I don't know. Um, one is a practicing architect and an educator. The other is an R and D at Adidas over on the uh, the consumer products, the shoe the shoe company. It's probably not called a shoe company, sportswear company. I'm not sure. We'll have to get a clarification on that. But together. Our two guests today have formed a company, a consultancy that they call Out of Architecture, uh, where they help people like you and people like me explore the value of your education, of your skills, of your talents, the value both inside the profession of architecture and outside of the profession. So let me click a couple of buttons here. Aaron Pellegrino and Jake Rudy. Welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Super happy to be here. It's great thanks, to have you. Thank, yeah, th thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with the technical issues today and the music. Although I don't this know, this is a great roller skating obvious. song from my youth. <laughs> we're we're going to yeah. get all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of. I, I wish that we we should have more music on uh, context and clarity. Well, this, this, it, you know what? I wonder if that's why we're not on Facebook. Maybe they're blocking us because of seriously, because you know. can totally tell what it is. Yeah, well, we we may get in trouble here. I don't know. Well, but right. yeah, okay. Well, that's all right. We've been in trouble before. We're gonna bust it out. Aaron and Jake. Um, one of the things that I have, two of the things that I've encouraged everybody to do is first of all, go to outofarchitecture.com and check out your website and look at every, look at the testimonials there and, and look at everything that you're doing. And I've also encouraged everyone to go over and listen to the business of architecture podcast. I think it's episode 411 where you talk with Ryan Willard, who, by the way, for everybody out there, Ryan is a past context of 30 live guest. Um, probably close to two years ago now, as a, as a, or a year and a half maybe. But first of all, that's a fantastic conversation with Ryan. And I, I think for me, that really kind of cracks open a lot of things that we, we talked about in Context and Clarity. When I first reached out to you, we were really kind of on the heels of, I'll call it the SciArc debacle, the, the panel discussion that they had. We had our own panel discussion where we talked about, you know, what, what about, what is it like working in architecture? And I love this as a follow-up because, you know, one question is, do you need to work in architecture? Now, all week I've been volunteering to receive the hate mail. If, if Did you get any? You're at, not, not that I know of, but I don't check the mailbox that often. So. <laughs> the spam filters okay. are working well. Spam, yeah, exactly. I don't even open my email. I don't know. Um, but but I, question number one, maybe, does someone that goes to architecture school, that's right, educated as an architect, do they have to go into architecture? I'm sure that we would both answer no. And, and I think, you, you know, it's uh, it's an easy answer because for anyone who's been to architecture school, including all of us, there is there are, there are so many lessons to be learned there that really often are lost when you transition into traditional practice, right? Lessons in creativity, lessons in client management. I mean, certainly those carry through if you're running your own practice and firm. Um, you know, lessons in just 
reading people and figuring out, you know, what the right responses are. Um, but I think in general, there's also a, a huge variety of skills. And that's something that Aaron and I noticed really early on is that we loved being in the wood shop. We loved, you know, drawing and making models and architectural education seems to be based in, uh, you know, a practice that hasn't existed for a really long time um, and is sort of preparing you for this artistry um, that is very different than what a lot of um, young architects experience when they first enter the profession. What has become really evident to us over the last four years while we've been running this business and also transitioning into other careers, working as, at places like you mentioned at Adidas, you know, we get to do so many of the things that we did in school, but in service of some other goal that's not necessarily buildings or the built environment. Um, it doesn't mean that it has any less hmm, fulfillment, maybe, purpose, passion, but it certainly does um, make people scratch their heads often when they say, oh, but you went to architecture school. And I think that's something that we have tried to address so many times in that, you know, being an architect, it's just a, it's just a noun. People change careers and professions all of the time. And it's only this sort of maybe strange scenario because of the way that we have culturally pinpointed architects, um, the way in which we have sort of highlighted architects as, you know, these very sexy, like very highly lauded individuals with, you know, one singular creative focus. I mean, we're all humans. We all have different aspects to our career than just the final product. And what we've discovered is that, you know, a lot of architects are really happy doing things beyond traditional practice. And I mean, I think I'll follow up with that with just, you know, I think it's our job as creatives, as people who are arbiters of the built environment, but also just arbiters of ideas that, you know, we control what it means to be an architect. And I think, honestly, the, the profession itself needs to adapt to a really a changing world. And in order to do that, we need to really sort of defy traditions um, in a healthy way, right? I mean, we're all used to an iterative process. We're all used to failing. That's one of the things that I think is is really great is that we've all gotten really good at, you know, hey, let's toil through an idea, get it out, mess around with it, and then show it to a bunch of people and see what they have to say. And I mean, that's the only way worlds improve. And the fact that we don't do that more often or we don't speak more open more oftenly about that, both within the profession and the changing boundary of it, um, you know, just just kind of re relegates us to irrelevance eventually. Um, so, you know, I think there's so many other ways to be kind of architecturally adjacent, to use your skills and, and the value that you provide to the world in other, in other ways. But there's also this idea of, you know, th this noun being an architect doesn't have to mean what it was when you went to school, um, just because at that point it was probably already outdated. And even, you know, my students now, what I think they think an architect is, is probably still an outdated, um, an outdated term. And I think the more we can own that and own the development of that and recognize all the skills that we have and the agency that we could have, the better off everyone is. You know, you, Jake and Aaron, you, you both mentioned now. And when you were talking to Ryan Willard on, on the business of architecture, you talked about the noun problem. And it struck me, I mentioned this earlier this week, that I was I was working with a client. And, and I, I had to play off that noun problem that you were talking about because what we were struggling with at the moment as we were working together was I think they had a noun problem. One, I'm an architect. Two, I'm a business owner. Right? These these are their own personal, you know, their own personal perspectives. And and so maybe we can talk about that noun problem a little bit more. But to me, the way that was playing out in this particular case is if, if I put myself in, in their shoes. I, I identify myself as this, I identify myself as that, and I'm really struggling to let go of those, of those two titles, of those, the, those two names, which is, which is keeping me 
and this is my opinion, but it's keeping me from achieving what I could possibly achieve or becoming my best self, maybe even as an architect or as a business owner or whatever, whatever all the terms are. Can you, uh, one or both of you, talk a little bit more about the noun problem as, as you see it and, and what you run into? Aaron, I, I would just start by saying one of the, the things that is super common that I think clients bring to us is, you know, we're looking through roles and they'll say, well, I don't have any, you know, any agency experience or someone will come and they'll say, you know, well, I'm, I'm such a generalist. And to me, that is like one of the proudest things you can call yourself, you know, and I, I would lean into that by saying, you know, I'm an expert generalist. I, I know a lot about a lot of things, not, not fully, you know, mastery maybe in any one. Um, but at the same time, you know, when we go back to that agency question, I mean, you might consider yourself an architect and a business person, but if someone comes to you and as part of your architectural project, landscape is involved, you're going to, you're going to dive in and do it. If interiors are involved, if working through a kind of, you know, larger scoping or maybe master planning or, you know, these are all areas that aren't necessarily the responsibility of the architect and over the years have been relegated, I think, to more and more consultants and more and more specialists. So maybe architects feel like, well, you know, I shouldn't be getting into that or I'm not qualified or... Uh, you know, maybe I just don't hold the right title. Um, but then you start to get even farther out into, you know, visual branding and graphic design and marketing and all of these things that inherently architects are pretty good at because they're creatives. I think we don't practice them and therefore we end up not being very good at them in the long run. I mean, I think most architects on this call would raise their hand and say like, I am not good at marketing. Um, you know, that might not be the case for the two of you who run a pretty consistent live show and have, you know, put your names out there and are selling your own brands. Um, but certainly, I mean, Aaron, I guess, would you agree that that's kind of one of the areas where we see people faltering the most? Well, and I, I think it's not being able to take stock of your skill set. Right. It's just not what becomes the focus, especially in, in school, but also in, in the practice. It's just like, just get it done. Right. You, you may be really good at, at producing the drawings or, you know, maybe you put the present presentations together really well because you've got a graphic eye. None of that ever gets, for the most part, acknowledged beyond this is what it takes to get the work done. But I think a self a skill audit is obviously incredibly useful, both to know what you're good at and also know what you're not. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And therefore, when you need to skill up, you need to skill up. But I think it's also a cultural thing. Um, I mean, last night I was having dinner with uh, four other architects, two of whom work in facades. Uh, one is uh, my business partner, Charlie, and the other is a, a close friend and a, a client who's actually um, now leaving uh, leaving the world of architecture to go adjacent and work, um, work in SpaceX, right? And we were talking about um, some of the classes we teach, the job that um, they were headed off to, and just like, you know, the weird public space we were in, in in the seaport in New York. And at the end of the night, we were all saying goodbye. And, and one of the facade uh, architects turns around and is like, you know, like, this is the first time in a really long time I've hung out with all architects and we talked about stuff that wasn't just architecture. There are all these other things that we bring into our lives that when we kind of can open it up, we can be sort of, you know, incredibly interesting and interested in other things. But I think the culture of architecture is architecture is the thing. It is a capital A thing. You worked this hard to become an architect. You own that title. It, you have to, you know, eat, sleep, maybe not sleep, um, live and breathe architecture. And I think, again, it comes back to re expanding that definition, but feeling like you have the security to do so. And I think for a very long time, I at least felt it. There was always a stigma around this idea of what do you mean you're not going to just do what everyone else does and, and work, you know, especially when you're graduating, work for one of the big name firms, go work for a star architect. It doesn't matter, you know, um, what sort of wage they can pay you or what your work-life balance is going to be like. You, you get that. There's no way you turn it down. And 
I don't know. I, I just think we're, you know, more, more, we can be more whole uh, human beings and more whole practitioners and more whole designers and creatives. If we recognize all these other facets of our skills and our life and our overall culture that we can bring to the, the skills that we bring to the world. I don't know if it's, uh, I, I see some a question up on the screen and, and maybe I can quickly add on before we, we touch on that. But I think to bring it back to a conversation we were having in the, the multiple green rooms before this, um, we had a, a little bit of a chat on, on burnout. And when we think about what it means as an architect to burn out, a lot of times that association becomes with having such a narrowed focus that you really don't have any other outlets. And as Aaron said, you know, it's, there are, there's work that is nourishing and there's work that is depleting. And if you narrow yourself self down to work that is only depleting, that's, that's when you get burned out. And as we can all recognize, it is a very real, very physical kind of tolling emotional phenomenon. What's really amazing though, is if we circle back all the way to our education and we think about the sort of general sense in which we learn design, in which we learn to see like, you know, a box, not as just this cubic form, but as edges and corners and lines and the different shading and solid void and all of these elements, you can apply that in so many different ways. And the ability and the desire and even just recognizing that very likely as an architect, as someone who went through that training, you want to have your hands in multiple things is really important. And I think isolating yourself down to just one focus, as opposed to recognizing that maybe in order to stay engaged, I need the ability to jump between a certain set of various goals, various projects, various topics at any given time, I think is pretty important. And and we often find that, um, you know, there's this moment when we speak to architects who have been in the profession for 15 years and they say, well, you know, I just want to narrow down and I just want to consult on this one specific aspect that I've been pigeonholed to at, in my firm. Usually we end up getting to the point where we say, well, it sounds like you actually want to do several things at once. And they go, yeah, but, but you can't do that. And that's just not, I mean, it's not true. Hmm. Well, so this morning we were talking about, all week we've been talking about this, but this morning we were talking about what we wanted to ask you about. And we were talking about the title of architect. And I think um, it was when you were talking to Ryan, you were talking about how people don't really want to let that go. So we were talking about that. So how do we get beyond the title of architect? And I feel, I feel like I could be open to a lot of things, but then when someone mentions like, well, don't call yourself an architect, I get a little bit like, well, I mean then what, <laughs> you know? So how do we get beyond the title of architect? I mean, I think everyone's degree of relationship to that title is going to be personal to them. Um, full disclosure, I'm the licensed architect uh, in the in the duo. Jake is is the, the recovering architect, so that's his RA. Um, and I think I'll, I'll speak for both, for both of us at, at the moment, which is that we wouldn't trade the training we've gotten for anything. Um, use it every day. Um, but both of us also have MBAs, which we use every day as well, but we don't go around kind of calling ourselves, you know, Jake Rudin MBA, Aaron Pellegrino MBA. The architect title is something I do embrace, um, but I recognize that that title means something to me. And most of the people I talk to that are not architects really are very ignorant to what that title actually is. They have this sort of nostalgic idea of blueprints, which I have never actually seen. Um, wow. In physical, actually, no, that's not true. There was You've a, never even a, a seen blueprint. them, like in a museum or anything. Blueprint of a burrito at Tenth Ave Burrito in Palmer, <laughs> okay. New Jersey. Uh, but aside from that, you know, actually seeing old school blueprints, uh, no, I don't. I don't think I have. And I think that's just to say that I think most people, uh, or one of our professors would call them normies, uh, that are not in the architectural profession <clears throat> or know an architect or something, really have very little idea of what we do. Uh, most of the questions I'm sure everyone in this, you know, digital room has gotten 
is, oh, you're an architect. So what kind of buildings do you do? Do you do like hotels or like, do you focus? You know, they have very kind of surface level questions about it, which is not to say that they're, you know, somehow, you know, not understanding of, of um, what may, you know, at least what the media may put out about what an architect does, but they don't know the type of thinking and training that we bring to creative problem solving. Problem solving. We make ideas out of nothing. And I think that is an incredible, incredibly powerful, you know, title to ascribe to. I make ideas out of nothing, but it's our job to actually educate people on what that is. Now, that being said, if you want to go off and do a different thing, and we do have clients who come to us and say, I want to go work for Deloitte. I want to be a consultant, or you know what? I want to go back, you know, we're more into the technical side and become an engineer, but how do I even talk about my experience as an architect and my experience as someone who's gone through that that training, perhaps that professional experience, a series of types of projects that proves that I can speak that language because the title itself doesn't encompass what a normal person would think an architect could do. I see that as a massive opportunity, right? It's like it's like when one of my professors in school would look at a, a drawing or like a model I made and said, you know, you're thinking about this like a fried egg. Why don't you think about it like a donut? And you have that kind of like aha moment, like, wow, what if I totally just reframe that? And then your mind starts to work, right? You can do that with a career pathway. You could do that with a job. Now, does that mean you're going to like immediately go and be a neurosurgeon? No, absolutely not. I don't mean that. But this idea that you can essentially understand the skills that you have and use that to define what it means to you to be an architect, that opens up a whole new world. So I don't think we have to run away from the title. Some people may need to retitle themselves, but I think it starts with understanding what defines us as an architect and then tooling that into you know, what it is that you do next. Because I still very much call myself an architect, but I explain to people what I think that is. Hmm. See, I, I think what you're talking about right there is, is a really fundamental issue, not, not only for what we're talking about now, sort of the, the career and, and job search world, but also talking about the value that the public perceives in architects. You know, how... What, like you said, well, what do you do? Do you design hotels or whatever? Blue, <laughs> blueprints, uh, all, all of those things. So how how do we, you know, and, and your your context typically, I'm assuming with your clients is is really on the on the career side. And so, well, I've got this talent, this talent, this perspective, etc. And, and so we can we can talk about it from that framed in that way, which is perfectly fine. Or we can look at it, I think, maybe from a thirty thousand foot view and say, okay, well. The next person that walks in here, if we were to talk about the actual value of an architect, what would we actually talk about? Because it's not going to be the blueprints or even designing a, a well, probably not going to be designing the Starbucks. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you go about starting these conversations, I guess? There's, you know, as you mentioned, there's sort of the career side of this, and then there is actually the business side of this. And Aaron and I do a little bit of advising on both. Um, you know, on the on the business side, I think it's recognizing that the structure of being an architect in the context of a business, especially if you're running your own firm, is not quite as, you know, I'm the end all be all and architects can do everything by themselves. Uh, what I mean by that is in this, this client that we have, she's running her own business. Um, they received just two people, uh, received a request from a very large, uh, Middle Eastern project, essentially formulated as a very large company with a seemingly kind of endless budget. And we were talking to them about what the scope that they're being asked to do, um, means in terms of billing. And they said, well, these are the, you know, this is what we would equate to, to our salaries. And we started to prod a little bit more and, and, you know, there's all, all manner of, uh, kind of details into these, these projects. But one of the things that came up is, well, who's going to manage the project? Is it, is the client going to provide a project manager? Are you project managing in addition to the consulting that you're doing to the resources? And it was so intriguing that this is just something that hadn't really crossed their mind is like. Who's going to do that work? It's in, it's inherent, I think, in a lot of us as, as architects that while we were receiving a project, we're going to manage it. 
but there are specialists out there whose roles and responsibilities relate to key milestones and dates and gates and all of these things that that PMs love. And the fact that we absorb those without thinking about them is one of the reasons why I think we just don't consider our value to be as as great as it really is. Um, from the individual side, it's very similar. So we have individual clients that come to us. We say, okay, what do you do? And they say, well, I know Revit and I usually work on this scale of building and maybe I coach or mentor this small subset of architects or whatever it is. Then we say, okay, what do you think your value would be if you went to work in retail design? You know, if you went to go to work for a business whose goal is not to build architecture, but to connect people with a product. And they say, that's a really interesting question. I never thought about that. And I say, okay, well, you know, would you be shocked if I said that you could be making, you know, 30%, 50%, you know, some, some grossly, uh, you know, disgusting salary at a company that has no intention of focusing on architecture, but needs architecture as a way to sort of track their brand through the entire customer experience. And if I ask you now about your experience and I ask you about the narratives that you've worked on with clients, the kind of you know way that you've incorporated a client's desire to expose their brand to the customer, maybe it's more service design, maybe it's workplace, maybe it's a play, you know, big Google headquarters or whatever it is, that narrative starts to reveal, wow, like this is all the value that I've brought to this equation, especially when I think of it as putting a big brand sticker on a piece of architecture, which we don't. We don't equate our love of space and form and circulation and experience to someone being really impressed and going and dropping a thousand dollars on a piece of, you know, apparel, footwear, whatever it is. Um, and that connection then becomes really tangible. And the more we talk to architects, I think the more Aaron and I find that we, we try to draw out of them. <laughs> we try to draw out of them. Okay. When you're pricing yourself, what value are you providing? And that question is so tough to answer. But when you start to look on the other side and say, what are you enabling for the customer? What value are they going to get because they are using your services? That's a lot easier to put your finger on. And you can do that with your career as well, is well, by, by hiring me, you know, not only am I weaving all of these things together, but you know, this, this, and this will be, will be possible. I think as a business, it's even more important to do that. And it's very difficult to unlock that key to say, well, my, you know, rather than basing my consulting fee on an hourly that I feel like is a reasonable salary, I'm going to look at what the output is and simply say that you're going to be gaining more than you're going to be spending. And if I happen to be making triple what I would want as a salary, that's none of your business, right? That's, that's literally my business. It is actually, in fact, my business. So it's a tough, um, it's a tough line to walk. But I, I think what you touched on is, is incredibly important, right? We have, we have this, in Entry Architect, we have this whole build your course and workshop. And, and that's really what we're talking about is what's, what's the, what's the value that you're creating or generating, uh, or the result that you're generating and what's the value of that. Um, so, so thanks for thanks for taking that in, in both directions. I appreciate kind of looking at it in the two different ways. Um, if someone is a student right now, and I haven't scrolled all the way through the comments, so I don't know, don't recognize off the right off the top if we have any students with us. But if someone is a student right now, what do they need to be thinking about? Aaron, I know you're you're teaching pro practice. I teach pro practice. One of NAB's big pushes is the idea of, of a path to licensure. I prefer to call that path to the profession because to me that also sets up the conversation of 
maybe path from the profession or path from school. So if if there if there's somebody that's in school right now, what do they need to be thinking about as they prepare to go out into the quote unquote real world and whether or not they end up in a in a traditional firm setting or in in an architecture adjacent uh, uh, profession or, or role or whatever it is, what what where do they need to be in their headspace? What do they need to be preparing right now? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I I teach pro prac as of a as a out of a pure sort of love to do it. Um, I love nerding out about business. I love ler- nerding out about you know how architecture can walk this line, um, and that was the reason I started teaching it. The reason I keep teaching it, though, is getting the sort of feedback and speaking with the students about what, what's really on their mind um, and realizing both, I think, recognizing the insecurities that I had leaving school and seeing what they're dealing with. Not only, it, you know, I left school obviously pre-pandemic, but adding the sort of state of the world on top of that and realizing that it's just incredibly important to be talking about what is that path to the profession. I love that you put it that way. And really, because that's what is the way that you're going to have agency in the world. And I think I, I say this a lot, but I, I like I like being a broker record on this point, which is that I don't think anyone becomes or goes to architecture school if they're not an optimist or an idealist in some way. If you want to put something or you have this inclination that you might want to put something on the earth, you're doing that because you want to go out there and do something good and cool and and you want to get involved, right? So what I try to, what we talk about with our clients and what I talk about mainly in, in my pro prac class is how do you want to spend your time for the rest of your life when you leave here? And there's, that's a huge daunting question, right? I don't even know that question now being in the profession for, you know, over a decade. But when we frame it that way, right, because they're all worried about their resumes and their portfolios and I got to find this job and I'm doing thesis and oh crap, this paper's due and all this other stuff, which is, you know, normal life shit, really. Sorry. Um, (laughs) You know, the normal life stuff, which is always going to be there. But we talk about, and I tell them from the outset, I am not teaching you this course to you right now as a third, fourth, fifth year. I'm teaching this course to the person that's going to be from five to 10 years from now in some sort of management position, either in their firm, in a new business venture that they've started, in you know whatever that ends up being. The, the person I'm talking to or the person I'm trying to, to speak to here is not the person that's worried about you know the immediate next step. It's that person. And I want you to try to put yourself in that frame of mind and say, what do I want to be doing with my time? Because time is the only finite resource that we have. Architects, I've found, I feel this way. I know this of everyone who I, that I know that is an architect. We have tons of energy. We find ways to make energy. We have find ways to kind of bring it to a project until burnout happens, right? But we have a passion for what we do. And that energy is something that if you get in this mindset of, you know, being able to, to, to work, to, work on yourself and and allow yourself to kind of rest and whatnot. That energy is is an infinite resource, but your time is the thing that isn't. So how do you want to allocate and spend your time in order to make sure that that energy is really what keeps you going? Um, It's kind of a little bit maybe like the Energizer Bunny, but really like we have, I I give them a final assignment where, yeah, they've got to submit their resume and their portfolio, or if they're looking to go to grad school, they've got to give me a CV and a, a comprehensive portfolio as opposed to a short works thing. But I also ask them to basically take, you know, their iCal or their sketchbook or whatever and draw out a week, five years in the future and put in how they want to be spending their time ideally. And I don't want them to say, well, I want to have be, you know, celebrating getting my license. No, not that. Do you want to be on site? three days a week? Do you want to be at a point where you're maybe on track to be a PM or you are a PM and you're meeting with contractors on site and you're, you're doing that? And do you want to be home by you know five or do you need to be home by three because you want to start a family early? Do you want to be doing the like funny one we always tell people, even though Jake and I have never done it, is like, do you want to be doing hot yoga twice a week? Put that on there. Do you want to be traveling multiple days a week because you want to, you know, kind of use your ability or use the skills that you have to kind of go see new places, put that on there. And I think when we design it that way, you're never going to, you know, predict the future in that way, but you're going to get people who say, you know, I actually, I like this wood shop thing. I, I would like to be in a shop maybe on the weekends, or maybe I'm at a design build firm and 
I'm actually working, you know, on site with some of the contractors or, or whatever, right? It helps them to think about what do they prioritize and then back that out into how do you spend your time? And that's an exercise we do with our, all, a lot of our clients, but a, a lot of the time our young clients who are just like, you know, they're so full of energy and passion. It's just like, how do I go out there and do it? And it's like, well, you kind of got to back into that based on what your priorities are. And it's hard to ask someone, what are your priorities? Like, what do you, what are your goals for the next five years? That's a really obtuse and somewhat invasive question. But when you break it down based on, you know, here's how I actually want to be spending my time, people, I think, get a little bit less daunted by that. And the question you can ask yourself if you are trying to to solve this without getting too grandiose is, you know, especially as a young either student or recent graduate is, you know, what would your friends have stereotyped you as in architecture school? You know, were you the model maker? Were you the renderer? Were you the person who was always computational design or super into robotics or, you know, just really like honed in on graphics and doing all the graphics for all the, you know, the parties that you weren't supposed to be having, but you still posted up all over studio because you thought the posters look really cool. When you kind of look at it from that lens and you think like, oh, that's the stuff that I just was naturally drawn towards, we can use that, you know, and you can use that to sort of identify, oh, maybe, you know, the reason why I put off my writing my paper in order to do that was because I just really enjoyed it, not because I'm a lazy son of a gun or, you know, whatever that (laughs) the, the alternate thought pathway might be. I, I, I love that. Love that perspective. What, what's the what's the makeup of your clientele? Or, <laughs> all right, guess the song. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's a good one. <laughs> you got dancing going over there. <laughs> what are, are your uh, are your clients mainly students? Are they emerging professionals? Are they mid career? What does what your clientele They're, look like? They are all over the place honestly. And we've had clients who are still in school to clients who are at the top of the firm, clients who have been in the practice for 30 plus years who are interested in moving to kind of a more of a consulting role or interested in just, um, you know, focusing on a specific parameter of their career. Maybe it's time, maybe it's money, maybe it's both. Um, We've had clients who are, we get, I would say there's there's buckets, um, but I'm always shocked. Uh, we have an intro call coming up with a client who said, you know, hey, like I've been doing this this thing for seven years and, you know, it's much more in the legal profession. I went to architecture school. I got a JD. And now I'm kind of thinking like, what's next? You know, maybe it's not law. Maybe it's not architecture. Maybe it's some combination. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. So they are really all over the place. But we definitely, um, you know, could bucket them into there's really that like very early years um, where a lot of students are just coming out and saying, like, I already know that I want to do something different. And then we have um, clients who really are, are thinking like, you know, I've put in my time. Maybe I've ticked the box of getting licensed. We have tons of people that say, like, I just really wanted to get licensed and now I'm there and I- I've done it. Um, and then I think there are sort of like the mid career burnout career, you know, where career, um, where really it's, it's about like, just, I'm in a crisis mode, you know, and I need some support. Um, and just very briefly, you know, there was a, a question from Twitch, like how do students pay for for our services, we have student pricing and we honestly didn't start this business to make money. So a lot of what we do is just completely based on how can we help you, you know, and like prices is something we really just try to make not be a barrier to getting support. Um, mm. Frankly, we basically turned on billing because we only have a limited number of hours, um, you know, that are usually either very early in the day or very late in the day. And so we've got to manage those in a way where, um, you know, it's sustainable for us and where we can also have the support of uh, a small team, which is really, you know, uh, a big, a big part of how we help clients and, and reach the right kind of people. That's very architectural of you. 
I feel like. I mean, because okay. I... Well, I, I was looking well, I was looking at your website and you both have full-time jobs. So when do you do this? So, I mean, that would be typical, I would think, that you just keep working. <laughs> and then also not charging people who can't pay. I don't relate to that as well. So I don't know. It just seems like what I would, like what I would expect. Well, yeah. Well, so I'll just make a couple points here. <clears throat> One of the things is, you know, going back to that point about nourishing versus depleting work, there's a lot of psychic income that comes from this. We do all of our intro calls on Fridays and we look forward to it every week because we meet the most awesome, interesting people. Um, mm -hmm. And if we can provide some some help and and sort of see that, see people's careers change or also just like expand our network with fascinating, you know, people who are doing cool stuff. Like we, we just genuinely love that. Um, there's a selfish part of this too, which is the fact that Jake and I have been, you know, best friends since like second semester architecture school. And, um, it's a way for us to be on two coasts and still work on projects together. You know, those used to be models or, you know, things out, you know, <clears throat> out in the the woods in, in Ithaca. And now it's, this is the, the project that we have that kind of keeps us together, but also allows us to help a bunch more people. Um, and then also, I mean, yes, we have, we both have full-time jobs. Um, this is obviously something that is a passion project for us, but, we've taken those looks at our lives and and I won't speak for for Jake explicitly but I certainly have and have said like how do I want to be spending my time I have the luxury and sometimes the burden of the fact that I do run my own practice but I have an excellent partner who helps me with that um and we also teach and so there's there's a balance there that allows allows that to happen and we also recognize that the work that we do here reciprocates back into the work that we do elsewhere, especially with, you know, the teaching on my side and also with the fact that there are a lot of alignments in, you know, sportswear and in the role that Jake has at Adidas where he gets to meet a lot of fantastic talent that may or may not be a good fit for Adidas, although that becomes a different, becomes a different thing. We have the ability to bring value of what we do here into other parts of our lives. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Jeff wanted me to get back to this question. What commonalities do you see with architects breaking out of architecture? So is it that, and you know, when I was thinking about, I was really um, struck by in, in the other, in Ryan's interview, when you said it's heartbreaking to get out of school and realize that's not what you thought you were signing up for. <clears throat> you know, when I think you said it was heartbreaking, didn't you? And I was like, yeah, it is kind of. It's it really is. disappointing. It's really disappointing. So are those people who are perpetually disappointed, are those the ones that end up coming for you? or? No, I think one of the most interesting commonalities is that people say, you know, I was never the designer who was comfortable with a blank piece of paper. Hmm. And it's really interesting because I think the architects who really enjoy playing off constraints, you know, really enjoyed the kind of like maybe they were the person in the group work who wasn't necessarily the innovator. They were the person who kind of came to the table and would say like, that's a really interesting idea, but like, here's how I would refine it, you know, and th this is the way that we could kind of practically apply that or merge these two ideas together. Um, or they just sort of understood a lot of what was going on. And I, I go back to the, you know, again, that's like an indicator of a, of a really strong generalist. Um, I also find, though, that there is about 50% this kind of disappointment, but then there's 50%, gosh, this sounds so cheesy, like hope um, of, I just know that, you know, I've seen what my colleagues have gone on to do. I've seen roles that maybe we studied in architecture at companies like IDO or even within the architectural community like mass design that's really has this purposeful focus that's where i want to be you know like i don't want to be at one of the big three letter name firms um and there are people who get a lot of fulfillment out of that and that's awesome and we really appreciate that but there's also not spots at all those places for every graduate we're graduating like so many more architects quote unquote architects than we need um, in actual architectural practice. And we have clients that go to work in tech or that go to work in design of some other kind of consumer good or product or architectural space that's, you know, not wouldn't be um, something that maybe a traditional architecture firm would either be capable or interested in doing. Um, and 
it's it's just amazing to think that I think and disappointing to think that we went through school without hearing about all those opportunities and that faculty at so many of these universities are brought on because they have a very specific kind of two person practice that is winning these really weird awards for work that they did for free or work that they did with student labor that was free that then they, you know, claimed as their own. And then, I mean, like, I'm not talking about anyone specific here, <clears throat> but I really do <laughs> think um, that's a common story. And I think you actually point to a lot of firms that act that way and benefit from that. And then you realize, wow, like, well, where did they get, you know, the luxury of being able to, to do all that stuff? And not everyone has that luxury. And it's like a super privileged position to be in, um, to be able to chase that stark attacked dream. Um, you know, we do have clients that are interested in academia and that is probably even a harder pathway to go down than just traditional architecture, you know, is that kind of architecture plus academia? Oh, well, you know, how, maybe I have to have a studio partner who's kind of one of them's teaching and one of them is actually running the practice. And how do you divide that? And it's, um, yeah, it's really interesting. So the commonalities are maybe hard to pinpoint, but there's a few stereotypes for sure. Yeah. Are and I think, you know, Jake, you, you bring up, I think something that you know, Catherine and Jeff, you were talking about initially what kind of spur spurred our initial con conversation, which was this, you know, issue at SciArc or what happened at SciArc. Sometimes the, unfortunately, sometimes the commonalities, especially around burnout or with clients who really come to us in crisis are really heartbreaking in the sense that it's, you know, we've had clients who've come to us saying, female clients who've come to us saying, I just can't work with my team anymore. I'm afraid to tell them that I'm getting married or that I want to start a family, or I'm afraid to tell, you know, the, and this is regardless of gender. Like I have, you know, I have a family member who's really ill um, or, you know, like essentially afraid to be human, whether whatever it means to be human to you, whatever that has to do with your, your gender, your, your, your race, your economic situation. Um, these are unfortunate commonalities that, I'm not saying we hear every day, but we hear them a lot and it's not, it's not unknown in the profession, but we're just finally starting to really talk about them. Um, you know, when, when people come to us and say like, I know why I'm not getting promoted and it has nothing to do with the work that I'm doing. It has something to do with the fact that I'm just a different color than the person who did get promoted or I'm, you know, I'm being treated a certain way because of X, Y, Z, or, you know, my, my project manager has basically said, I'm, I'm useless until I get to a certain point where I could be of use, but there's no, you know, no training or throughput to make that happen. So unfortunately, some of the commonalities are issues that we just have that are systemic in the profession and systemic in other professions as well. It's not just us. Um, and that is really, really tough because it's not to say that like, okay, once we get you out of architecture, you're going to be fine. It's rather, okay, how do we, how do we address that what you're going through is, is not okay just because it's happening and everyone's letting it happen or whatever. Um, but also like, how do we, how do we then even just totally reframe and, and try to help? Cause we're not therapists, right? We're not, we're not here and we're not trained to do that, but sometimes there's a lot of value and a lot of impact with two people who have been through what they've been through in terms of like architecture school and boot camp and the, and just saying like, it's okay for you to not want to be in this situation. And the amount of times we've had people on calls with us kind of like emote or break down or just say they just needed to be told that um, is, is, a, is a significantly non-zero number. And I don't think we knew that going into this, but it's become another really amazing part of what we can do to try to help people realize that like, this is what change starts to look like because it doesn't happen. I tell my students this too. It doesn't happen from the top down. It just can't. It's going to take too long. It happens kind of as a community all together saying that like, no, we could do this better. And what we bring to the world is so much better than how you're being treated at the moment. And this goes way beyond just architecture. I mean, I have the opportunity to mentor quite a number of people at Adidas and I absolutely love the work that I do there. And I think a lot of that goes both ways, but I've had, um, you know, Adidas colleagues come up to me and say, Hey, you know what you shared, um, about salary negotiation, 
was really impactful for me as a young person because, you know, maybe our senior leadership don't have the issue of, you know, not understanding that they could stand up for themselves or, you know, elaborate on a value that they bring. But I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know that that was something I could do as someone just kind of coming into uh, a big company. And to see that is really impactful. Or, you know, I really enjoy where I am, but I didn't feel comfortable having a conversation about other opportunities within the company. I still want to be here. How do I have that discussion with my leadership, my manager without, you know, alienating myself, right? And these are worries that, I mean, architects certainly would have, right? Is, hey, I don't like this part of my job. I don't know an architecture student who is ever told how to have a conversation like that. And it might not be even something that the two of you touch on in professional practice. So, you know, we are trying to open these discussions up for um, people and we recognize and know and are familiar with the problems in architecture, but it's not just architecture. It's also out of architecture. That's a, nice, that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> it ties a nice little bow on it. Um, I, I know we, we've actually passed the, the top of the hour. This is another one of those conversations. I say this a lot, I guess, but it's another one of those conversations. I wish we could, you know, just continue for a couple of hours. But to be respectful for everybody's time, maybe, maybe one thing we could do to wrap it up, up, wrap the conversation up, is to ask, you know, for everybody that's either here with us live or watching this later in some replay version, what's one thing that somebody, maybe everybody, ought to do individually for themselves to really think about, um, I don't know if you call it their most successful future or their their best vision of their future. But what's, what's something we really need to be paying attention to? Um, I mean, I don't want to be repetitive and say the time exercise is important, although I, I do think it is a question I ask myself a lot and Jake and I ask ourselves a lot and we'll ask our clients is, is what does success look like? Um, and not from like a monetary standpoint, but like if you needed to make, and everyone I think knows that there are certain things in their life, whether it's their career or their, you know, personal relationships, whatever, everyone knows that there are like certain changes they can make to make it better. Um, and we're architects, so we're constantly improving. It's our job to look at something that's seemingly perfect and find everything that's going to go wrong and fix it. So <laughs> I think the thing there is, okay, so a year from now or a month from now when this project is over, what does success look like? And sometimes that's just finishing the project. Sometimes it's just getting to the next milestone and surviving and living to kind of design another day. But if that question, when you ask yourself that question, if you can't be see beyond the next week or month or so, because you're so kind of encumbered, then I think you need to have an honest conversation with yourself about how, how overly taxed you may be and what would success look like a year from now if if it wasn't that way. Um, I use the five-year exercise with my students just because I typically teach BRCs and five years of, of a degree, you know, they went into this thinking, all right, when I graduate, I know I got a diploma, then what? Thinking of it in five-year chunks is sometimes helpful, but even for me, sometimes I'll, I, I like to do goals and sort of, you know, next month, the next three months, the next six months to a year, and then overall. And for me, it's like, all right, if I hold myself accountable, like every few pages in my moleskin is, is that list. And what does success look like on a daily level, on a weekly level, on a monthly, on a yearly level, then at least it helps me kind of break down how I want to spend my time. Hmm. I think that's, I think that's super helpful. And I would just say from the perspective of someone who's a little less far out, I get asked a lot, you know, like, how do you feel when you're helping people who are going into roles that like maybe you would want to be going into, like, doesn't it kind of, you know, if you've been in the same role for, I've been in the same role for five years. And I think a lot of people probably listening have been in the same position for a decade, 20 years, 30 years. And one of the things that really helps me is just to kind of sit down every once in a while and evaluate why I'm still in my position. So almost the converse, you know, or, or complimenting to what Aaron is saying about what does success look like? And for me, 
my management the ability to do and work on a huge variety of projects trump you know a lot of the really shiny salary numbers that are jobs that make you work 90 hours a week on one thing that are you know maybe would require me to move or to be in a different place which is really important to me like that sense of you know rootedness or stability um and so having that discussion with yourself just kind of allowing yourself to play out like okay who was the latest person that you know in my network kind of made that change and i went oh man you know and really thinking about what would it feel like would i actually take that job you know if i was jealous of them why was i jealous you know was it really just because it was a big number is it because i was actually interested in the work they were going to be doing maybe you reach out to them and find out like hey how is it um i had a, a very good friend who went to work for apple and uh i sent him a message a few months after he started to work there numbers the numbers were insane let me just say that. But his response that was like, I'll talk to you in a year. I was like, I, okay, I can see, I see what's happening. He made a very conscious de decision to go do that, to say, I'm going to use this as a stepping stone. I know this is going to be really um, an intense amount of work. But to Aaron's point of what does success look like? Think about it in terms of like what, what it would feel like. Also, you know, when you think like, oh, that's that's what success looks like for me. How do you feel when you hit that milestone? Like, are you even more exhausted than you are right now? Maybe it's a bad idea. <laughs> you know, are you um, have you saved towards some goal or made progress or actually maybe backed away from the amount of work you're doing? Those are really interesting things to think about. So. I, I think both of those, that, that's, that's great perspective. On both of those there's so much to unpack there um but great advice and i think i cut you off there. no i was just thinking thinking about what success means to me <laughs> Catherine's going through the exercises as, yeah. as i'm sure a lot of people in our audience are um if you want to know more about what aaron and jake are doing out of architecture.com the urls in the bottom left of your screen right now uh go check it out go look at their offerings find out more about them, reach out to them. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot to that you could explore here with the help of Aaron and Jake. So uh, to both of you, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation and, and for everything that you're doing. I think it's really important work um, for students, for emerging professionals, for all, all of those people that you mentioned. But I also think, I really, I'm not just, this is not hyperbole. Um, I think it's important as we think about the future of architecture. So thank you for everything you've been doing. Thank, thank you. you this has been fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate you being here. And everybody else, everybody out there in our live audience, uh, enjoy the music. Uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us today. Um, thank you for making context and clarity a thing. I say this just about every week, but I really mean that because without showing up and, and making context and clarity a thing, we wouldn't be having conversations with, with Aaron and Jake. So thank you for that. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, now, tomorrow is the final Friday in the month of May, which means it's Context and Clarity Book Club. Book Club. Uh, discussion. Yep. Our book for this month was Sorry I'm Late, I Didn't Want to Come by Jessica Pan. So that'll be the discussion. <laughs> so let me, Aaron, awesome. I'm going to tell you, I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've read it. I haven't, but so, so Jessica Pan is a is an introvert, and she decided to spend a year essentially living like an ex like an extrovert, going through all kinds of different experiences and documenting them and, and turning this into a book. So, for all of the introverts out there, it's a fantastic book. It's an entertaining read, um, but I think there's a lot of really great insights in it. We'll be discussing that tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. And on Context and Clarity Live next week, Jessica Pan, the author of Sorry I'm Late, I Didn't Want to Come, will be our guest. Context yeah. and Clarity Live. So we'll talk to her next Thursday. That's so, super awesome. exciting. And yeah, hopefully buy that. we can do the reverse order because I think Aaron and I are slated for our book to come out at the end of October. And so maybe sometime the end of the year, early next year, we can be your, uh, your book club guests. 
Yeah. Absolutely. That would be awesome. Because we never got to, what do you do with a 55-year-old owner who wants a new job? We didn't get to that. So yeah, there's a chapter in the book. Is it? a chapter in the book. I'll sign up. All right. All right. Thanks so much, guys. So we have to we have to get that book to get you guys back to talk about that and talk about the new book. That'd be fantastic. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody out there. Again, appreciate all of you. Thank you for all of this. Um, please take a little bit of time to breathe, relax, find a way to get rejuvenated. We're going to do this all over again tomorrow and next week as well. Um, there's a lot of craziness going on out there. Please be well. Stay safe. Keep those around you safe and well. And um, I hope I'll see you around somewhere sometime soon. Thanks, everybody.